As a U.S. Senator, you'll swear an oath to uphold the Constitution. What federal agencies do you believe are unconstitutional? This is not an easy crowd. No, it's not, it's not an easy question. Um, you know, I, I will say, you know, prior to doing this, I've sat down and I've read the Constitution probably thoroughly, three, three, probably about you know, five or six times. It is not an easy document to read. It is not, unless you study it in detail, it's hard to study. So, broad, pardon? Not that big. No, I, I realize that, but I mean, it, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so to make broad sweeping statements, I'm just not prepared to do that. I mean, if you want to talk about specific things, I'll answer specific questions about it. Do you think the Department of Education is constitutional? Well, what, do, do I? Based on Article 1, Section 8. <laughs> I, I, I think there's been an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of stuff done that Do, do I like? To, okay. Let's, let's 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 talk about education. I like I, I believe in local control of education. I've, I've served for three years now as the business co-chair of the Partners Education Council for the city of Oshkosh. Um, even before that, I was highly involved in the Catholic school system. Okay, uh, because I believe it's extremely important to have a private alternative to public education. Um, what I learned, I would say, going into that experience, I was all supportive of No Child Left Behind because I think it's extremely important that we hold government and that kind of bureaucracy accountable. What I learned, having gotten involved in the system, though, is all the unintended consequences to the No Child Left Behind Act. And there's just so many strings that flow down from the federal government mm -hmm. to the state government to the local government. Mm -hmm. the, people, the people I deal with from the standpoint of teachers and that, I, mean, I think teachers know how to teach. And I think all those rules and regulations from, from the federal government make it extremely difficult for teachers to teach. You know, whether it's allowed by the Constitution, I mean, let's face it, right now the Supreme Court is saying it is. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm not going to be bucking up against there. But I can say from the standpoint of education, I think local control makes so much more sense. And to me, it is. It's absurd that we allow the federal government to be the tax collectors for the localities, and then the local governments have got to beg for those dollars to come back down to education. Okay, I mean it's, it's just it's just all topsy turvy. Okay, so I mean it's 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 a, it's a different way of answering your question, but I think it gives you a pretty good feel for kind of what my philosophy is on education. When you talk about local control, it's good. Do you think that if a community decides that in their school system or district? They want to allow creation as well as evolution to be taught that they should be allowed to do. Yes, I mean that's 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 what local control. Okay, I, I do not, you know, I absolutely do not believe the federal government should be dictating curriculum. Um, you know, truthfully, about the the main role I can see for federal government would be one of the things we pushed in Oshkosh was uh, something we call the Academic Excellence Initiative, which really talked about how do you teach more, better, easier, and you know, by using better technology, by using the best method teaching practices for things, you know, sight and sound, you know, videos, that type of thing. I, I can see the federal government being somewhat a clearinghouse for some of those best practices, but not dictating, you know, just making things available, you know, making it easier. <coughs> when we went through that, I was, I was, we were trying to lo locate curriculum, and all, all these school boards developed their own cur curriculums, cost them millions of dollars. I mean, you kind of have some central clearinghouses, that kind of makes sense. So. so what kind of, what agencies would you eliminate? Yeah, I just, you know, I, I haven't given thought to which ones I would eliminate. What I would want to do, okay, and again, as an accountant, you know, I look through the federal government, I see these things and go, okay, here's, here's the Department of Commerce, here's the Department of Education, here's the part, and I, I can't tell you that, I can't rattle off the billions of dollars per agency, but you look at that and you go, what are they spending $70 billion on? What is this one spending $90 billion on? Which one, what's, so, what I would want to do is institute something like zero-based budgeting, where you go into those, into those departments and you go, okay, what are you really doing? You know, justify your budget from the ground up. Uh, as opposed to what you know, what the federal government does now is they have uh, baseline budgeting, where it's like, okay, now your budget's eighty billion dollars, it's going to grow ten percent, mm -hmm. and then when they squawk when it only grows two percent, they say it's that only grows eight percent, it's a two percent cut. Mm -hmm. well, it's, still, it's still an eight percent increase. So, I mean, I think that's how I'd answer that in terms of, uh, you know, I think you have to look at each and every one of those agencies and, and you know, 
seriously take a look at what they're doing. Is there a more effective way to do it? Is, is there a more local way of doing it? Well, it's just that, you know, agencies that go back to FDR, rural electrification, we still have that there. Because I think people are unwilling to make those tough choices. Are you able to make those yeah, tough that's, choices? That's, that's what I want to do this. I'm not, I'm not, doing, I'm not doing this, you know, I'm not doing this because I want to join the club. You know, I'm, I'm doing it because I actually want to get in there and tackle the problems and start, start rolling back government. What do you think okay. your odds are? Pardon? What do you think your odds are of rolling it's, it's back? Be, it's going to be extremely tough. It's going to be extremely tough. I understand that, but you got you got you got to start somewhere. Okay. And again, I, you know, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have the whole game plan laid out here in terms, of, you know, this, that, and the other thing. You know, all I can say is I've just got a very sincere desire, and I think I've got the capability and the background to to actually intelligently do it. I think one of the things that we've we've heard in the with all the two party things that we've done and the conversations we've had. I think a lot of the, let's say, constitutional conservative electorate, their concern is that there's a machine in Washington, and the machine is its own entity. And as you go in with these ideals and these, these principles, that when you get into that system, what confidence do we have? What is your moral compass? What is your sense of principle? What is your uncompromising attitude toward what's right? to give us confidence that once we say, okay, Ron, go in there and fight for us to, to have our country taken back, what 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 can we hear from you that says, yes, we believe that he isn't going to change, that he's not going to go in there and all of a sudden vote for principles we don't believe in? It's a fair question, and, and about the only answer I can give you is, again, I've tried to lay out, I've tried to describe to you, I've tried to convey to you who I really am, you know, why I'm doing this. I mean, I tried to give you the a sense of, you know, that's why I tell a story about my daughter. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty strong motivation for trying to do some of these things. Um, I mean, when, in, in considering doing this, I mean, this is, this is not a lifelong, lifelong ambition on my part, on my part by any means. I mean, I've got a, I've got a very nice life in Oshkosh, I love it, you know. And one of the things I, I said in, in my convention speech, you know, if, if this attitude of actually trying to tackle these problems gets me, you know, kicked back to Oshkosh in six years ago, oh, great. I mean, I love Oshkosh. I love Wisconsin. People live here. Um, I mean, I, I can't give you any guarantees other than tell you I want to solve the problem. And I think the, I think the uh, best hope we have and the encouragement I get, you know, as I started off, as I started saying, I'm meeting so many people that are coming up to me and saying, I've never been involved in politics. You know, I want to get involved in grassroots level. It's also true of elected, I mean, people who are standing for election. Okay, there, there are an awful lot of, you know, I can't remember which senator this was, but uh, uh, when, when I've been asked, well, what's the first thing you want to do? I mean, I, I do say I'd like to repeal Obamacare, because, again, I, I do that as such an assault on our freedom. Another, senator, another potential senator said, filibuster. <laughs> okay, so, well, that's not a bad answer. Um, I think there will be enough people, I'm hoping, there will be enough people like myself that we can actually create some momentum. To have your own little caucus of, of people dedicated to actually fixing these problems. This is the best hope we have. But, I mean, let's face it, there are an awful lot of entrenched incumbents, and it's not, it is not going to be an easy task. I mean, I, I have no doubt about the fact how difficult it's going to be. Now, and, all, and all I can tell you, in all honesty, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't want to tackle the problem. 